Well, we're coming closer to an end with this discussion, which might not be an end. It might be a, a beginning or a continuation. So one of the things we'd like to accomplish, I think, at this point, we'll try to retain some of the folks with microphones, hopefully, to assist with this, is to, uh, rather than have myself provide any wrap-up comments, I'm, I think we're interested in looking at feedback from the audience again and the participants here uh, about next steps and a pathway forward. And I, I guess I'd lay out a, a little bit of uh, um, observational challenge with that. You know, we can all have, and we're good at, kind of recreate or, or uh, discussing aspirational um, type of comments uh, and, uh, and goals. Uh, really not goals, but aspirational um, observations. I, I think what we're really looking for, but not into the weeds, is really what, what sort of actionable process-based steps do we take from this point forward to advance this conversation? Um, we know or have an idea, I think, individually of where we aspire to be or think others aspire to be, but what is that pathway forward? It's a process. I don't know that we're interested entirely into really minute details, um, but, but if specifically from individual sectors um, that have responsibility uh, for either technology, um, uh, producer groups, um, agency folks, what, what is that pathway forward and how do we uh, set that into motion, when do we set that into motion, um, and how does that correspond uh, more appropriately with, with what we've heard here, obviously knowing that these recommendations are going to meet the light of day some point in the very near future, I believe, isn't that correct? Uh, they may go out for comment from USDA, um, be published, I would assume, in the Federal Register, and that comment would then be taken and, uh, and I think would be very complementary to some aligned processes that help better inform ultimately what, how those recommendations then become actionable. So with that, um, I think I would like to turn to the audience uh, underneath some of that direction to, to have some dialogue at this point in time. We'll capture all that, but ultimately I think you need to understand that it's going to come back to each of you and us and others that are not in this room to, to make that happen. So who wants to be the brave soul that kicks off this discussion for the foreseeable uh, minutes that we have remaining in this forum? I see Joe's still in the room, and one question that I wanted to ask him, ask him and I missed the opportunity is, how have you utilized RFID tags for management and profitability in the operation? I think the, probably in the onset it's, it's mainly efficiency and being able to manage my herd and improve on the quality of the herd. Um, would probably be at this point with the markets the way they are and it's not being recognized as probably the, the, the most significant factor. But uh, I think over a, a five to ten year period by utilizing it with the calves as well, I think that I can improve productivity as well in, in quality of cattle. Um, it's like I said, I think I use it more as an insurance policy and efficiency stress on cattle is far less. I mean, I hear I hear people in some of these meetings talk about, well, it's more going to be more stress on the cattle. It's actually a lot less. Um, so, if that answers your question, Terry, I guess two comments. A number of times I've heard, and I understand from different perspectives, these seem to be the same conversations that have been going on for a long, long time. That said, I think that there's a lot of information that was presented that we could demonstrate about where we've made advances, and it's with existing uh, ADT rules. I think it'd be good to demonstrate some of the things that were presented that are advancements, and those are all across the board. Those are producer advancements. Uh, there, there's greater functionality within states, 
and a lot of the things that, that USDA is involved in as well. Beyond that, I think we could look at low-hanging fruit of what can be continued to be accomplished with existing rule without changes. And it, that's going to happen because there's momentum already that's going the right direction. There's a lot of good, uh, good stories that are being told. The other thing that uh, without the, the mandatory and voluntary conversation, one of the other changes that I think is a, a needed benefit that producers can probably take a lead on. If they don't, it won't be successful. But when we talk about Open Records Act and FOIA protection, whether there's, there's most of the time it's protection that's needed, um, some states have too much sunshine. But if, if states, state animal health officials go to their legislatures, it's not going to go well. If producers go in those venues and ask for protection, that, that there needs to be, it's not a one size fits all, but it, it's a gap that where producers need protection and they probably need it today in a lot of different states. I'm really pleased with where we're at, but maybe in Colorado we may, may need to take another look at that if you all need further protection. But I, I, it always pleases me when someone does a CORA request and by the time we redact the information, there's nothing left. Um, pleases me too. Huh? It pleases me as well. Yeah, it, 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 those are happy times. So, uh, yeah. So, Keith, question on that: Is this something the state veterinarian? So, so one thing is is knowing what all of those fifty states and X amount of territories and and et cetera have for those state laws. Is that something you all have compiled in a resource that could be referenced and maybe has a bit of commentary associated with it? I know that's an undertaking, but it seems like there could be some value in at least having that as a resource. I agree. I think there would. If that, if that exists, I'm not sure where it is, but I think pretty quickly you could have some model legislation, and Colorado's may be that, that provides a, a good de degree of protection, and but it gives us latitude, too. We can't dump data, and we can't just do a transfer of our files, but in specific disease traces, we can provide information that makes sense, and then there's some caveat that if it's a catastrophic or extraordinary circumstance, then we can. And uh, so I, I think there's that's something that's going to take some work, yep. take legislative change, and it'll be individual states, but there's probably ground to be gained in that regard. Thank you. Next, Matt. Yeah, Matt Deppe from Iowa um, with the Iowa Cattlemen's Association. And so what, as I got ready to, to come to this opportunity to, to listen, learn, and see some opportunities ahead of us, uh, working with a membership of 10,000 in Iowa, very diverse, as I commented earlier yesterday, um, really trying to find, from a trade association standpoint, that pathway forward. And one of the, the big resounding themes that I think is as we work through roadblocks on that path in front of us is, is the question of how do we carve out the opportunity to engage the industry. And it's been stated over and over throughout the last two days uh, in relationship to wh where, where does the industry stand in, in, in context to find a solution. Uh, Joe talked about it this morning, a small group uh, of, of folks, um, various sectors on the producer level and, and interests like the Livestock Marketing Association. Um, so I think as we move forward, and this is just generally speaking, I don't have any details in my mind just yet, but the question is how do we um, pull together a group of, of stakeholders, the folks that are going to be connected to this, whether it's positive or negative, um, and, and drive that movement forward. We do need to take some time from a producer perspective and find those advantages of utilizing this technology outside of animal disease traceability. Putting the ROI in my operation, to me, regardless if I'm a 50 cow um, herd or a 10,000 head feed yard, is really, really important. And there's obviously some, some opportunities there. But I think generally speaking, in relationship to where we're at right now, um, in phase one and moving forward, yeah, there's some things that we need to tie a cinch knot in really tight and fix, possibly. Um, but I don't know that we're going to get there without some practical input from the stakeholders as well. 
So maybe we can drill into that a little bit. I'd be interested in others' comments. I mean, I heard Matt talk about a process of moving forward. Obviously, that's within the beef industry. I'd assume other other species might might have an interest in that too. Um, and, and and I also heard you talk about how do you create benefit, maybe direct benefit, not necessarily indirect long-term benefit, the insurance policy, but also maybe direct benefit. So I'd be, be encouraged to hear from others in the group that maybe represent themselves as a producer or producer groups on their feelings related to what Matt had to say as we go along. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you. The, uh, you said uh, a lot of what I wanted to say, and that I think just moving just that vision of what we need with the traceability system. I think it it's something that you know that accomplishes traceability, but it does it in a way that that uh, does not interfere with business. And in fact, the, the the speed of operation, the businesses actually find ways to benefit from it. So it encouraged you know the industry to to rather than push back it. Uh, against the traceability system, find a way to make it pay, you know, make it benefit your business and, and utilize that. And I'm hearing that here, and I've heard it from our industry in Texas as well previously. So I think that vision would be a, a system that's, that that's, uh, embraces technology um, that, that lowers some of those, those barriers, that, that fear factor that, uh, um, that Mr. Leathers talked about earlier, we, we, these kind of media, I'm encouraged by this participation today and all and what, what's going on, but uh, that's sort of my vision of what uh, the traceability would be, is accomplishing that traceability, but benefiting the industry and maybe the new speed of commerce accommodates just a little bit of time to put that technology in to get that tag in because there's a massive benefit at the end. So I would turn it to my industry partner, if I may, then to... Ross? Ross Wilson, Texas Cattle Feeders Association. So to uh, Matt and, and Andy's good points, and I'll stick my neck out a little bit as far as uh, next steps. And, and maybe volunteer as a plan A. We can come up with a plan B if we need it, but maybe volunteer the national organizations, producer organizations in this room to plan a meeting before the end of the year and invite this great working group of federal and state veterinarians and other participants that came up with this good list of 14, uh, 14 goals. And then we can get down to prioritizing that because I think it's in the minds of all of us, whether we're cow-calf or stalker or feeder or another stakeholder in the U.S. beef uh, production chain, technology companies that are helping support this, what is our next step? So I think we all agree that we fix the current known identified challenges with ADT, and then we decide if we are ready to do adult cattle intrastate or feeder cattle interstate or some other piece of that puzzle. We don't need to decide that today, but that's, to, that's where this working group comes in. And I would challenge, I think everybody in this room probably, I'll stick my neck out again, I'd like to think that everyone in this room is here for the purpose of advancing the U.S. beef industry and animal ID and traceability. And it is a bit embarrassing to look at where the other countries are. We can learn from what they're doing as far as, uh, in, so there's a cost associated with doing all of this. Some of it can be offset through incentive-based uh, ideas and programs. The Canadian system is at a point now that in August, at least it was announced, I don't know when it will be implemented, is that depending upon the official ID and the channel, I don't know if it's specific supply chains or all the cattle, I'll learn more about that because I'm interested in talking to some U.S. bankers, but the Canadian bankers have talked about lower interest rates and lower equity requirements because it's all about collateral protection. And there are a lot of other incentive-based ideas that can help offset the cost to moving forward. The other thing that is very embarrassing is when I think about aquaculture. We're chipping, I don't know how many, Allflex could tell us. How many million? A few million salmon going over a dam, okay? That's a competing protein, obviously. And I'm just a little bit embarrassed that the aquaculture industry is ahead of the U.S. beef industry when it comes to ID and traceability. So I'll get off my soapbox and shut up, but we would like to be a part of moving forward. 
So, Ross, I think you called a couple things out there, and I guess I'll take a moderator's prerogative after the next comment, so you all that I call out now are going to have to uh, have to respond to this. But you, you mentioned, Ross, the national producer organization. So, Chelsea, prepare yourself for a comment. National Cattlemen's Beef Association, prepare yourself for a comment. Anyone else in the room that represents producers, or a or a, or a, you know like markets like like the actual beef producers or other species don't feel like you can't stand up and talk from another species perspective let's be ready with the mics for those folks after we go from our next comment thank you appreciate the opportunity to comment and i and i've appreciated the conversations we've had the last uh, day or so and uh, some of them last night where uh, sometimes we have to agree to disagree but ultimately we have to keep in mind what the end goal is you know and that's the ability to trace trace and track livestock in the event of a disease outbreak in a system that works for everyone uh, from the farm gate level um, through the livestock marketing channels uh, in, in conjunction and partnership with our state and federal officials and then on to the, to the processing floor and then ultimately how this impacts the consumers. Um, we've dealt with this disease in our state and we've heard uh, several comments about that yesterday and over the years and you know there's nothing that will get you to a disease traceability program faster than having a disease uh, where you have to trace and track livestock from the farm gate level through the processing level and it's not easy but it works and it works when the industry takes hold of it and, and, and leads the effort, takes charge of the effort, and then sells the program to the rest of the industry so that there's buy-in. And I will tell you that, it, that not everyone agrees, and that's okay, but when those that are involved in fixing the problem, when there's a problem, those that are involved in dealing with the problem typically come up with the best solutions. So I think the comment about forming a group, an industry-led group, is critically important. Uh, the, the timeline was talked about, 2023, and, and I heard a lot of comments yesterday and I heard different comments last night. Uh, um, I'm a firm believer that 2023 is probably way too long. Uh, that's quite a distance out. Uh, we probably need to, to look at a different time frame in mind and speed that process up. Technology-wise, uh, certainly it would be great if we had the ability or the availability of dual-purpose technology. Low frequency works for some, high frequency works for another. I'm guessing that technology companies can figure out uh, if you give them a charge to uh, come up with a technology that works for both and it works at all levels. If that's not the case and low frequency works best for everyone, then let's grab the technology and move forward with it because, as we know, technology is always changing. What we have available today will change tomorrow. Um, we know that's a matter of fact. Um, we need to research into what other countries already do. Um, yesterday that question was posed to the working group that technology or the, the systems are already out there. There's no point in us reinventing the wheel, uh, not only from, from systems in other countries, but systems in states here in the United States as well that have programs in place that already work. Um, Finally, I would say that um, it is important to keep in mind that we are never going to please everyone. If you please everyone, we probably have not done our job from an industry standpoint in developing a system that works. There will be those that don't like it, there will be those that champion it, but in the end we need to make sure a majority of the industry, a large majority of the industry, grabs a hold of it and leads the efforts and moves forward. So. Um, that's kind of what I heard the last couple of days, and hopefully some of those comments can be carried forward. Thank you. Jennifer Houston, Vice President of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And I do want to say I appreciate very much um, all the thought that the working group put into these 14 points. And I also appreciate the fact that y'all really took a lot of flack as you went out uh, last summer and listened to in most cases what was wrong with the system in a lot of people's eyes and so now I think it's a great opportunity and, and Ross and, and Matt I know NCBA certainly wants to be a part of the solution going forward so my first question Dr. Hammersmith for comments before comments what kind of timeline are we on do we have a y'all have a comment time in mind or So in regards to the uh, working group report, we certainly want to 
post that on our website as well as publish it in the Federal Registry with a comment period probably of 45 days. So we're hoping to um, get that document uh, later this month, early next month posted, uh, receive comments, and then um, take those into consideration at the working group level and uh, have a, you know, we list it as a preliminary suggestion, so we would like to make a final copy uh, report of those recommendations and certainly continue to have those collaborative efforts if a industry working group can uh, receive those as well and help us through the discussion of those recommendations, all of that would be really great. I don't think we have a rollout plan for any rulemaking process. That's not in the cards. We need to make sure that uh, we're on the same page before we go down that track. Definitely not a proposed rule. It's a publish of uh, notice of availability of the pre preliminary recommendations that we'd be uh, soliciting comment on. So we give everybody the opportunity to, uh, to comment, certainly. Well, I certainly we, we do support this industry-led um, group to be part of the solutions and to take the framework of what you all started and hopefully come up with some consensus things to make what we have better as well as what Ross and them alluded to is going out forward in the future is what we need. So. Chelsea Good, Livestock Marketing Association. Terry wants me to stand up, I'll stand up. Um, I repeat the um, thoughts of the last couple people. You know, we're all here because we care about the U.S. beef industry. And I appreciate the, the working group coming forward with some um, actual recommendations. I didn't know if that was gonna happen in the last, next couple days. So I know it feels like we're beating lots of the same dead horses over and over again. But I think having actual recommendations as a starting point, that, that, that's helpful. Um, as we talk about the next steps, you know, LMA definitely wants to be at the table. Um, need to be honest that I think that our livestock market owner operators feel like they've got a lot to lose in this process in terms of the, the risk, the liability, the cost of tagging. If we as an industry want to go down this road and find ways to spread that cost and that risk across the different sectors, I think that that's how we're going to get, um, at least my segment, a lot more excited about taking that next step forward. But we want to be at the table. Um, I think that there's a lot of conversations about technology, that if we can answer some of those questions from a industry perspective, that's going to be helpful. So um, you know, I think at the end of the day, we want to be a part of these conversations as they move forward. As we look for, for the next person, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, communication and having actual producers be engaged in this commentary publicly, too. Because we always hear, um, and Burr, you could speak to this, too, when you write a, write a really quality article um, about any number of issues. <clears throat> Generally, all the, the work that you went into that article, gathering resources and talking to people on the ground, you've kind of got a good context of it. But in many cases, and I'll be critical of this because I'm guilty of it even as an exec, but certainly as a producer, and I know our members are, a, a lot of those good people that gave you the support you need to author that article don't stand up and comment on, on their position or their opinions. They're busy people. We get that. But we need to find a way to facilitate the voices of the producers that find value in a program like this um, to the masses. Because I know in Colorado, and many of you have in other states, when we, we've recently done a statistically relevant survey with producers and we ask them who they trust, where do they get their best information from. Um, the first, the first uh, and you may chuckle at some of these, but the first is their neighbors, right? They want to go to their neighbors and understand what their neighbors are doing and how they feel about things. Uh, the second is, is their trade associations. Um, I'm not going to tell you how far government ranked down on that necessarily, but you were in the top ten. So that's good. Uh, trade publications were in the top five. Um, but I, I do think we need to find a way to manage the uh, 
the gymnastics that are going to go on around this discussion too and really empower you know, Mr. Leathers, I think you had a lot of great common sense, and I think you're a trusted resource in the industry, and I know you don't need another thing to do, but I think sometimes it matters when people like you stand up and, and speak about these issues, because there are a lot of people who want to know what you think. And we have to figure out how to facilitate that as we move along as well. So just, a, just an observation. Next, uh, next person with a comment. I'm the other Ross in the room. I'm Ross Baker from the Nebraska Department of Ag, the Animal Disease Traceability Coordinator. And i just like to echo or reaffirm what Mr. Leathers brought up this morning to um, involve the industry. I like the 14 points we have here to work with, but I think in each one of us, in my position, each state I think has a component in our cooperative agreements about an advisory group. We've had an advisory group in the past at Nebraska but when they would come up with some good recommendations input, it wasn't always allowed to be acted on. So I would like to go back to Nebraska and we will take action on this, we will take the 14 points and I'll have people in the room that will want to skin me before they want to listen to me. At the same time, I'll have somebody on the other side of the table that will think we just make it mandatory, we set the date and we go. My fear is that if we set the date as a hard date right now is that why do you even bring me here? You already made up your mind. And, and, but I still, I like the idea of getting it by before 23, but it can shut down the producers that want to have input because why should I? You've already decided. So it creates a challenge in that regard, just the way people think. The other thing is, it's just it's simply an idea I'd like to float and I don't know who can pick it up and work with it, but we talk about the cost of tags. Cost of tags isn't that serious to me. To some size producers it is, but the other thing is they, they want to use that in their business, in their business management. They need to have reading equipment to utilize it then. So why don't we think about some tax incentive credits for the producers at different levels and try and float some of that instead of how are we going to distribute the cost of all this. And that, that's really complex. Thank you. We've got one over here and then we'll come back. Hi, I'm Teresa Drysdale from the Michigan Department of Agriculture, and uh, I'd like to echo some of the sentiments that Mr. Birchmeyer made about looking to states who already have RFID, uh, a mandatory RFID program in place. Um, I'd certainly like for Michigan to be part of the conversation and for you to look at us as an opportunity to learn how this technology can be utilized, uh, how our producers feel about it, some of the lessons that we learned in trying to implement this as a mandatory program uh, so that we can maybe um, on, a, on a broader scale, implement this nationally. Um, please come and talk to me. Um, you're, you're all invited to come and, and see what we have in Michigan because I think we've done a ver very nice job of utilizing the technology, uh, implementing um, equipment into several of our, of our uh, livestock markets and slaughter facilities, uh, as well as having our producers learning about ways that they can use it um, for their management uh, plans as well. Um, also, I'd like to speak just, just briefly about ultra-high frequency RFID. Uh, in Michigan, of course, we use low frequency. Um, all of our infrastructure is built around low frequency, and that's because we do have bovine tuberculosis. One of the challenges with ultra-high frequency is that individual animal disease testing is uh, pretty much impossible um, when you have lots of animals nearby, those tags will read at such a large range that it's, it's very difficult to narrow down to one individual animal. So please keep that in mind when we're discussing which frequency to go with. Um, I think a dual frequency ta tag would be the best um, to allow us that flexibility uh, of multiple purposes with one tag. Thank you. So, so Terry, just one quick additional thought. When I mention the national organizations, I want to make it clear that I include NIAA and USAHA. Scott and Ben and, and Katie and others play, have played and will continue to play a very important role in facilitating this discussion and they may actually be the mediators, intermediaries as we move this process forward. 
Good point. I think we'll let our chairs and, and president respectively as they end this session make some final observations around that if that's okay with you two gentlemen. Um, other, other, other sectors, who do we, have? yes ma'am, and then we'll come back up here. Not a sector specifically, but I, I just want to go back to one of the things that we talked a little bit about yesterday and has become even more clear to me today, and that is that the quote unquote industry that we're talking about is diverse across the country, and I don't think that there is a one size fits all, but what would be incredibly helpful um, and I think useful to everybody is to define or identify the industry that is going to be engaged in this. And, and that may be uh, the, the national associations that represent different sectors, that's absolutely fine. Or it may be producers of XYZ species that are above a certain uh, number of head per herd or flock or uh, farm gate income or whatever the case may be, but defining that would be very, very helpful. And what I would like to do is go back to my part of the country and let people know that, look, th th these, are the, these are the categories of the industry that are actively engaged. And if you aren't in those categories but you want to have input, get your input to these people. And, and give people a pathway to, to provide that input. And then at the end of the day or the end of 2023 or whatever we end up with, if those people haven't taken advantage of that opportunity, tough, tough beans. You, you know, you get what you, you get. What you get. But I, I think to me it is still very vague what we're talking about when we talk about industry. And I worry that there are a lot of people missing the boat and if they're informed of that information and then they still choose to miss the boat, that's their problem. But right now I think it's our collective problem that we haven't defined that and I hope that that can get done. Yeah, I think that's a good point. We'll go up here in a second, but there's a term of art called the coalition of the willing. I think I've been in too many of these conversations that have uh, a certain lack of will. So I think that's one litmus test we can achieve, hopefully Ross and others in the beginning, at least from the industry, is that we can spend our time uh, bearing arms or we can spend our time moving forward and I, I, I think we have to prioritize that up front here. Thank you, sir. As a state veterinarian, let me tell you, I'm really excited about being able to attend this meeting, state animal health official. And uh, I, my, the, to us in the southeast, some few different uh, issues, but I'm really excited that the the glass on my desk is half full. I've got a lot of optimism that we're going to finish this before I retire and start drawing Social Security. And, and, and so we still hear, I still hear some industry sectors, producer groups in our part of the country that are saying, that not belligerently at all, but they're just saying, we're not going to do something, we're not going to do this until y'all, until we have to. Not, not being mean about it, but when they got work to do and they got stuff to do and they're just saying, Dr. Frazier, hey, you just tell us when we're supposed to do something and, and we'll do it. We'll figure out some way to do it. So back to the timeline, I, I, I got the slogan for you guys. It just came to me. The Lord give it to me. Are y'all with me? He just gave it to me up here just a minute ago, Mr. Mr. from uh, Four Sixes. Listen to this. Here's y'all's slogan right here, 2020 vision. I've got 2020 vision. We're not going to do 23 on 2020. I've got a T-shirt I'm going to buy, my, a coffee mug. I'm going to put a tattoo up here that says I've got 2020 vision. Are y'all with me on that? Ain't that good? Ain't that good, Ben? I got 2020 vision. I'm going to get me a tattoo put on somewhere back here. <laughs> I'm excited about the opportunities. Thank you, sir. We'll hold you to that, and we'll be looking for the picture shortly. Scott, did you have do you have a comment? Yeah, if I could just just for a moment. I'm speaking on behalf of National Livestock Producers Association, for which I serve as the president and CEO, which is also an organization like LMA that, that represents markets, but its markets markets are organized as cooperatives. And I look around the room, you know, these last couple of days, and there's a lot of people I've gotten to know over the last 20, 25 years around this issue, and those in the room that were part of an effort that we're, I think, talking about right now where industry comes together and tries to drive this forward, you know, it got short-circuited, quite frankly, in 2003. There was a lot of good work that was being done by industry voluntarily to, to come together and address a lot of this. I think at one time we had 70 organizations as a part of what we call the U.S. Animal Identification Plan. 
volunteer process, everybody was at the table volunteering, it, you know, NCBA was there, LMA was there, I mean, I, countless numbers of, of state organizations and at that time other species because, you know, the, the swine industry was there, um, uh, uh, the sheep industry was and so forth. Now we know that that's kind of off the table. It's so refreshing to hear kind of that, that enthusiasm starting again because, you know, if we sit here, we've sat here now for 14 years and we know where it's gotten us as far as ID. I, I, I'd say it's encouraging to hear, Ross, what you're saying about it, uh, others in the room. The state animal health, health officials are so key in all of this and in, in making it work, and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by it. I hope that this, can, this enthusiasm can carry forward and bring people back together. And yes, there will be naysayers. We know that at the time, back in, in 2001, 2002, when we were really working on this, we had a communications committee as part of that we put out for public content, you know, just, just to get ideas. We had death threats come in on that. And that, you know, it, it, it's probably there's an element out there that's still always going to be that way. But if we stay the course that we're, we're on now, we'll never get anywhere. So just a comment I wanted, wanted to offer. Thanks, Scott. Good point of reference. Question down front here with Renee. Renee Strickland with the Livestock Exporters Association. I'll make this quick. First, I want to thank all of you that have been through this process for 14 years. I've been on the outskirts. I've known about it, but I'm kind of glad I haven't done this for 14 years because you probably have gotten burned out. Coming in as you're heading towards hopefully the main stretch, uh, I see three key different ways this really needs to be addressed. Um, educating producers, the Beef Magazine survey was very telltale. Uh, you've got a lot of producers out there that are afraid of a cost. I think they need to get simple, simplified down or dumbed down to the fact that it's just a cost of that ear tag. Please don't get wrapped up in having to get a computer software program. Just tag your, your cows. That's if we got mandatory. Um, also privacy. That's obviously their, their other concern. That's going to have to be for integrating databases between USDA, state reps, all the industry and privacy is huge. So that's another, you know, vector out there that needs to be taken care of. LMA is absolutely essential for anything mandatory to be on board. I think it's really important that cost analysis get done for getting the livestock markets on board. You can you can get the the producers on on board, the majority of them, but if you can't implement it and you can't control it, then it's no good. So that needs to be done. I applaud the 2020 vision. I applaud that. China opening up is a game changer, and the faster we get on board, the faster these producers can actually be eligible to sell their beef globally and put more money in our pockets. That's my incentive. I'm going to go buy a reader. I'm finally going to do it. I've been talking about it for years. I'm going to get those cows in my computer. I'm going to get rid of flap tags. I'm going to get RFID. It's time. I work globally. I know the benefits that are going to come to producers. It's not if. It's, it will come to producers. It already does put more money in their pocket, what we export outside, not to mention the disease situation. So those are my four things that I see as an outsider kind of coming in. I appreciate y'all listening, and I really appreciate all the efforts all y'all put into this. Thank you. Gentleman in the back will take credit card or cash. <laughs> I'm Sylvia Kristen. I'm the executive director for the South Dakota Stock Growers Association. Um, I would just say that we, the recommendations of the 14 points, there are some points on there that are, I think, good. Um, we're, I think we would support wanting to come into better compliance with our current um, expectations for ADT and what the current uh, framework calls for. I think there's room for improvement there. Um, I would say, however, that as an association, my members are, are probably not there yet with mandatory electronic across the board. Um, 
That's not because we're opposed to technology. Uh, my board president can't be here today because he is tagging his yearlings for an agent source program. So we're not averse to technology. We encourage our members to use voluntary programs to do what they need to for marketing, for managing their herds. Um, and we encourage technology um, among our members. And we have a lot of really creative, um, awesome producers. So I a little bit reject the comments that are made here today that um, there's just a bunch of producers out there that aren't enlightened yet. Um, there's a lot of guys that just haven't chosen to do this. Um, and they're good operators, they make smart decisions, they just haven't chosen to go there yet. We do have concerns about a mandatory program, we have concerns about privacy, we have concerns about costs. Um, and again, that's not because of some kind of lack of enlightenment, it's because there's legitimate concerns from our producers on the ground who are gonna have to implement this. Um, so we will, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I was, have learned a lot, I've taken a lot of notes. Um, I, I really do appreciate the conversations that have gone on in the room. Um, we're committed to continuing the conversation, um, but just with the note that my producers are not there yet. I think we'll we'll uh, we'll end at least this section um, on that note. I think that's a, that's a salient point, and it's it's a it's a call to action for a number of us that represent those producers to kind of spread our wings. So I I think there's I think I'm being no no terminology association here, but being trumped. So you, one more comment. Thank you. <laughs> so Caitlin McCulloch, that. American Farm Bureau. I just wanted to chime in here and say. Thank you all for participating and allowing us to participate in this meeting. Um, it's been very helpful. The speakers have been great, and I've learned a lot as well. And we're looking forward to also being part of the conversation in the future. I think the advisory group is an excellent idea, and we hope to be part of that as well. I've heard a lot of talk here about the cost of value and how much it's going to cost to the producer, and that's an important conversation for our members as well. There's going to be differences in how we should move forward regionally on a state-by-state -state basis as as diverse as the opinions in this room. And so having those producers have a seat at the table is gonna be important to at least have their voices heard and come up with the best solution. Uh, but what I would also remind you, it's not just the cost of the tag that we're talking about. It's the cost of the value of what it protects when we talk about disease traceability. Because in the event of an outbreak, all of us in that room will bear that cost. And it's gonna be a lot more than what one tag costs. Um, we obviously have some concerns about confidentiality as well. And we look forward to working with all of you to develop the best plan moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think as we adjourn this, I would like to call um, Dr. Tony Forshee and Dr. Boyd Parr forward uh, from NIAA and USAHA respectively to kind of leave us with a parting message, maybe, maybe some call to action additionally. Uh, and thank you all for your patience and time. Well, I, I'm the state veterinarian for Ohio. I'm the chair, current chairman of NIA, and I have no authority, but I did out in the hallway during a break appoint uh, Joe Leathers as a new chairman for this advisory committee <laughs> under no authority of my own. So <laughs> I think that, you know, uh, we've, we've talked a lot and we've done a lot of talking in the last several, several years and I think I'm real pleased with this meeting. I'm real pleased with all the turnout. I'm real pleased with the comments and real pleased to, to learn that we are all on the same page and we are on the same boat and we, we just need to get to where we, where we need to be. I still have on my wall in my office one of the original NAIS posters. Now, I've got it kind of hidden behind a cabinet, but I still have it. And I think back about how that started off and how really piss poor job that was, bringing that out and the way it was brought out and we're gonna do this and do that. And I think we've turned totally <clears throat> from that to, to uh, see, seeing what the true value of, of uh, officially ID and our cattle and our livestock to do and what uh, the global demands are that it's gonna do it. We've got a lot of great companies out here that have helped us along the way. And to USDA, we, we, we as state animal health officials, we think we've done a really good job in, in tracking disease and, and disease uh, um, traceability. I think we've gotten much better at it over the years. And so 
we're not totally ill repaired for this, but I lo certainly like the idea of voluntary, let those that want to do it do it and want those uh, see the advantages of that. And, and I told Mr. Leathers that I thought he really kind of made our meeting for us. Uh, I, I think we kind of just all lightened up a bit once he got done talking and, and with his vast knowledge and vast experience and where, where there is true value in this. So hopefully we can uh, move forward. I think we can. And I want to thank uh, Neil and um, uh, Burke Healy both for allowing th that working group data to come to us. I think it really helped us a bunch in, in the last two days. And so I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, and just to know that um, NIA and, and USHA as both will, will certainly be um, wanting to move forward with this and help lead and, and facilitate that. That's what we do as organizations. So Boyd, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. On behalf of U.S. Animal Health Association, our executive committee, I want to thank our moderators for the excellent job they've done. Uh, I want to uh, thank each and every one of the speakers who I think all brought unique uh, perspectives for us to hear. Uh, I want to thank the working group, as Tony alluded to, and USDA for the, the, the work they did in, in bringing us specific proposals to chew on. and, and to move forward. I think that uh, really uh, helped make this conference so that we could, could see where we were going forward. And then I want to thank each and every one of you for giving of your time and effort. And, and, and I uh, encouraged you when we started to uh, the success of this conference would be based on whether you participated and got a value for your investment in time and money. And uh, by and large, I think uh, you all did. And I, I thank you for that. Uh, you know, this, this, this is a, a, an important, uh, another bite of the elephant. Uh, as people have, have alluded to, we've been at this for a while. I'll put on my hat as a South Carolina state, animal, state veterinarian, a state animal health official, and say I, I think we have made, as Tony alluded to, significant progress. I know, I know in my office and a lot of others, there are a lot of things we're doing a whole lot better. So our efforts have not been wasted, and we haven't done nothing for 10 to 15 years, and I think we can demonstrate value to Congress on the money that's been invested. But I would also say that I think, uh, given our current structure, we have, uh, about plateaued, we have some incremental progress we can make with the current system, but anything significant uh, is, is unlikely, in my opinion. So the timeliness of this, I think, is, is really good. We have a lot of opinions that are valuable to try to bring together. Uh, I like the exhortation for industry. Uh, th this meeting has a, a good mix. Uh, I would encourage each of you, we will we'll continue that process coming up at U.S. Animal Health on uh, October 17th. Our Livestock ID subcommittee will meet that out. Dr. Rod Hall is chairing that committee. As you have looked at these recommendations from USDA, if you have opinions on them that uh, you think the majority of U.S. Animal Health, and I think all the groups that I've heard speak, uh, maybe, maybe I'm missing on some, but I believe all of you are, are agency members or, and have representation and will have a voice there. So that is the first opportunity I see to begin developing consistent points. I know some resolutions have already been circulated. If those of you have uh, talked with Dr. Hall, if you have ideas about things you like and don't like that we might can adopt in U.S. Animal Health as a consensus, that's a nice way forward. It will help make that meeting more efficient if you can communicate that to uh, Rod prior to the meeting so he can circulate it to the uh, committee. There's been a robust discussion going on now. So I think that's a good opportunity if we have in just a few weeks to take another step uh, with what's been presented to us. So uh, with that, I want to, uh, uh, again, we thank uh, USDA for, for asking us to put this on. Uh, thank Katie and Ben for, for the work on behalf of NIA and U.S. Animal Health on doing the logistics. And mainly, uh, again, I'll thank each and every one of you for your active participation, for your concern for 
uh, animal ID and particularly the livestock industry that you've expressed by, by not only your presence but your uh, input into this process. So, thank you.